2020 meeting of the Housing Opportunity Commission's Board of Directors. Uh, welcome everyone to this first meeting of July. We are now into the month of July and things are going so quickly this year, we'll be in December before we know it. <laughs> You're right. It seems like despite all the things that we are confronting, the one thing that doesn't stop is time. So we can start with the first order of business, which is the information exchange. Do we have someone present today from the resident advisory board? Does anyone know whether anyone from the advisory board is going to speak today? Uh, Ms. Kaufman was here. It looks like she's maybe. She looks just like... signed back on. I saw Yvonne Kaufman's yeah. name pop up. Okay, so let's just give her a second. Ms. Kaufman? I'm on. There you go. Perfect. Here we are. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Yvonne Kaufman from the Resident Advisory Board as Vice President. And <clears throat> reporting that uh, June 15th was our last meeting where we met virtually. Um, we received a presentation from the Information Systems Division with Carlos Taylor, the Acting Chief of the Technology Office. Uh, Mr. Taylor showed, shared with us the mission and vision of their division and how their application supports are handled um, with the new system as well. The board is looking forward to working with Mr. Taylor and his staff to bring more visibility for RAB to the website and update our pages and to correct our current email problem. Um, Last month, I reported that um, the edge management had told us that there was one person that um, was a victim of the virus. And to date, we have not heard that there are any others. Uh, that's from the town center hub. Well, that's However, good. Yeah, that, that is really good. However, the resident advisory board members continue to encourage our residents to continue to wash their hands and practice social distancing and wear their face masks in public. Um, the children have not quite caught on to that as yet. And we're hoping that we can instill that uh, with them as they gather uh, during the summer months. Uh, we are still accepting applications for membership and we would like to add about three more persons to our role. Resumes should be sent to the attention of Rita.Harris at HOCMC.org, who is a special assistant to the Director of Resident Services. Uh, if there is a matter that um, would come before the Resident Advisory Board and refer to us uh, to look into, please email us at RAB contact list, that's all one word. That's RAB contact list at HOCMC.org. Our next meeting will be uh, Junda, uh, excuse me, July 20th. And uh, that will, will be virtual at 6 p.m. And August, we will be on break. That's it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we go to the next order of business, which is a report of the executive director, I would like to make sure you are canvas that we have a majority of the board present. And I'll call the roll. Um, Francis Kelleher. Present. Richard Nelson. Here. Keith Simon. Present. Linda Kroon. And Pamela. Present. Hooker. Did you hear me? Yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, Pamela, I don't think it's come on yet. So we do have a majority of the board present. Uh, so we'll go to the next order of business, which is a report of the executive director. Man. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. 
it's a, a, a bright sunny day today. Um, so I, I, I was remiss this month. I actually am submitting my report late, and and so I, uh, Patrice will issue a revised packet, uh, which will be inclusive of my report. But I wanted to talk through a couple things with you, and the first is um, that. Although we are continuing to be vigilant around uh, protecting staff and customers for COVID, we've, we've clearly not uh, stopped business. And as part of that, uh, family self-sufficiency staff uh, have been assisting uh, with the processing of the COVID-19 rental applications. We That team by itself has processed uh, well over 100 applications. Um, FSS continues to be active generally as well. Um, we actually had a, a virtual financial literacy workshop um, and we partnered with uh, the Emmanuel Brinklow Seventh-day Adventist Church in order to conduct that as, uh, wow. two, two days ago. Uh, we had somewhere around uh, 33 uh, <coughs> participants in that workshop and it really focused on building credit, which uh, is, is super important um, and uh, we're excited about, about continuing uh, that. I will say that Although this has been an inconvenient experience, uh, the distance learning uh, components, I, I think, hold a, a great deal of promise for the future as well. And I think that's across the agency. Um, on, on June 26th, uh, FSS uh, was participating in a virtual meeting with HOC Academy, as well as our fatherhood initiative and the new WorkSource Montgomery representative. Uh, and so um, I, more to that, uh, is that, as I said before, we're continuing to pick up the, these tools and, and try and enhance uh, customers' lives and, and community with them. And um, although we are in the office sparingly, we recognize the need for customers to, uh, to sometimes come directly to uh, one of the sites for service. And so uh, in order to make sure uh, everyone is protected, we continue to sanitize surfaces uh, we have installed plexiglass uh, at, at both customer service centers, uh, as well as the other office buildings um, to provide that barrier. Um, and we're doing it uh, in order to, to prepare for the time when we reopen and customers are, are, um, are there for walk-ins and appointments. Um, uh, we, we do continue to have most of our staff working remotely. Uh, one of the notable exceptions is our maintenance team, which is hard at work um, in the field. They've done a great job responding to um, a number of emergency requests, which, as you might imagine, are focused specifically, most specifically on air conditioning um, and, and cooling this time of year. Um, but that noted, during this month, uh, during the month of, of June, uh, they completed over 1,300 work orders and um, just over 10% of those were emergencies. So uh, they've been quite busy um, and, uh, and, and working at some of our vacant units as well, and getting them ready to for, for lease. And then I'll, um, I want to sort of call your attention to just generally some of the service coordination that continues to happen and highlighted resident services uh, uh, over the last few months, and I'll continue to highlight them and, and uh, thank that team for everything they're doing. Um, they are distributing care packages uh, to HOC households. Um, that, you know, we're, we're, we're now at somewhere uh, just over uh, 450 uh, households over the last couple months, and those items are, you know, uh, paper goods, hand sanitizer, um, uh, uh, sanitizing agents uh, that are that are um, congruent with the CDC's list uh, and masks as well. Uh, so we're we're continuing to try and, and be uh, supportive. And then additionally, uh, we have uh, what is what is turning out to be an ex exceptionally strong partnership with Emmanuel Brinklow Seventh Day Adventist Church, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a, a, a a grab and go distribution, and we are providing. Uh, we, the resident services team, is providing uh, delivery services to um, folks who are living in the northern part of the county, as well as in the and one of our hubs. And so, um, I just I, I want to highlight that and lift it up because that team continues to work. And then I'll I'll close this one by saying we um, we had prepared for and are seeing uh, tumult in the financial markets um, as are 
as I'm sure you you are commissioners as well as uh, um, the viewing audience. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say that in, in spite of, of, of that tumult, we uh, HOC were in the market um, on June 24th uh, and sold uh, bonds totaling um, just over $67 million. Uh, and uh, a part of that, um, that, that bond issuance is used to fund the mortgage loan for acquisition, renovation, and permanent financing of Bower Park, uh, which is that 142 unit, 100% age and income restricted residential community for seniors. Uh, and so uh, we had a, a, a phenomenal um, day in the market, um, really did very well. Karen and team uh, executed it with the, their usual um, precision and grace, and, and uh, I, I also should thank uh, Bond Council and our financial advisor, as well as uh, uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, uh, for all their help with that. So with that, uh, if you've got questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and uh, again, uh, I apologize for submitting a report late. Uh, if I could, Stacey, um, the plexiglass installation, is that being done by contractor or by staff? Contractor. Contractor? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, could you also give us a little update on the uh, uh, administration of the rent supplement program? Uh, the, the, the COVID-19 uh, rental uh, application program? Absolutely, I can. Yeah. Uh, and so I want to I wanna point out um, quickly that um, uh, we have, we received over 2,000 applications. Um, we were working uh, to, to meet an incredibly tight window of launching the program um, and then, and then uh, issuing checks for that first window. Um, and we worked really hard to make sure there was equity in terms of the ability for folks to submit paper applications as well as uh, electronic applications. And uh, what we found broadly was that um, despite our best efforts um, and despite um, uh, I think a, a, a incredibly diligent uh, effort on the, on on the part of the staff. We received the vast majority of, of applications were uh, incomplete, uh, so they did not have full documentation, um, uh, or um, there were other challenges. And so I want to I want to point out very quickly that this is federal money, this community development block grant money. We at HOC uh, as sort of the administrator of this don't have any leeway with regard to the federal government's requirements around citizenship um, or uh, some of the other uh, requirements of, around documentation. Uh, and nonetheless, um, uh, we found with the vast majority of applications, some challenges. We've reached out to folks who had incomplete ac uh, uh, applications from a, a documentation standpoint. Uh, to this point, um, uh, there are um, less than five applications. I think actually around two applications that have actually received uh, oh. um, uh, that actually were processed for payment. And that you know there are uh, unfortunately more. It's more than one issue. And this is we we actually had a conversation with DHCA about this um, as we found um, this was going on. And it's not unlike. Uh, the other program that they're administering. administering. So it's taking us a, a great deal of time. What we've decided to do with the county is reopen the application process uh, within the next week and a half after we've completely processed all of these. Uh, and, and you know, we'll work um, to, to um, review process uh, and either approve or deny applications uh, until there is no money. Now, I want to I also want to point out very quickly that there is no, um, we're not in any danger of losing the funding at this point. Um, uh, we've got quite a ways to go in terms of time. So um, it's not a lack of diligence. It really is uh, generally um, uh, issues at the application level itself. So the, the I'm sorry, go ahead, Commissioner. Stacy, are the people able to submit the additional documentation so they can be approved as you're going through them? Yeah, uh, as we, so well, I, I think I mentioned earlier that we, we've reached out to um, those persons who were denied for, for issues around mm -hmm. incomplete documentation, but otherwise um, 
uh, were fined, we reached out to them to, to get additional Okay. There's also an appeals process for persons who were denied. Uh, and I think some of this is, a, you know, we're having a myriad, myriad issues, uh, uh, including uh, people not being able to substantiate uh, that they can uh, pay rent for a series of months. That's a requirement in there. Uh, and um, and demonstrating that they, they, they've actually been impacted by COVID. And so I'll give you an example on that last one. If an individual was having challenges with rent payment prior to COVID, right, which is you know sort of March timeframe, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't that that individual uh, from a technical standpoint will not qualify. This is this this, and, and we, you know, not our decision. Mm -hmm. It's part of the CARES uh, Act. These monies were provided for that reason, and so we don't have leeway to just sort of wave yeah. something in. And the agency itself would be uh, potentially on the hook uh, for using these federal monies in, in a way that's uh, out of step with the, the uh, regulatory environment. If you reopen, uh, Stacey, are you going to highlight those areas that people need to pay special attention to so that they yeah. can reduce the errors? We are. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to highlight them, uh, but I, I'll also I mean, say the, the mechanism that uh, our, our call center will be, uh, you know, pressed into greater service. Although they did a great job um, within a condensed time frame, but they'll be pressed into service to uh, be fielding calls and and uh, helping folks through applications. Uh, uh, so yes, we. Okay. Short answer is yes. Uh, have you given any thought to perhaps developing a Q and A format that you can make available so people could go and access that information through a Q and A and be able to address maybe uh, from that standpoint issues that they may be confronting with the application process. Sure. So we uh, we actually have a very robust uh, um, uh, frequently asked questions uh, component to this, but um, obviously we're going to add to that based on our learnings uh, over the over the past couple of weeks. Okay. Very good. Are there any more questions? If not, um, we'll go to the next item on the agenda, which is the commissioner's exchange. Is there any exchange between commissioners that we need to raise at this time? No. Seeing none? Other than just wishing everybody a happy 4th of July when it comes. <laughs> Very good. And, 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 and a safe one. That's yes. true. There's, there's not a license for you to go out and get into big gatherings. Trust me, I'm not. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're right. No, you're yeah. absolutely correct. Yeah, you no bars. Get, no bars. And if you have barbecue, do it, do carry out. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me go to the next order of business, which is the approval of the minutes for the minutes of June 3rd, 2020 meeting. Can I get a motion for approval? So move. Second. Move. And probably moved and seconded that the minutes of the June 3rd meeting be approved. Any questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Everyone seems to have responded unanimously. Uh, the next order of business will be our committee report. The first committee report will be Budget, Finance, and Audit Committee. Chairman is uh, Rick Nelson. Yeah. I'm trying to get uh, the first. Somebody or... Somebody that's in. Terry, is that you? Yeah, it's Terry. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, Cornelia, I think you're probably going to have to pop in there for this one. Yeah, no, that's fine. Right um, Terry, I, I, yes. okay. So I, it's, um, there's a lot of noise. So um, if you want, I can go through it. Okay, so the first item on the agenda is the approval of the, the FY21 County Revised Spending Plan. Um, so we were uh, contacted by the county um, and basically um, and basically they are asking for us to reduce our spending for FY21, both on the operating grant as well as on the, the capital improvements program. 
Um, they're requesting a 6% reduction right now, um, which equates to $409,000 on the operating grant and $125,000 for the capital improvements program. Um, we are basically just asking, you know, for your approval to go ahead and make the submission to them for the reductions. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'm sorry, what page is the resolution on? Thirty-five, I think. That is re correct. Resolution twenty fifty-three, page thirty-five. Okay, I'm, I I move approval. I second. So, Roy, are you there? Oh, Roy's muted. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we are probably, probably moving second. Move second that, that the uh, resolution 20-53 be approved for the approval of the fiscal year 21 county revised spending plan. Right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposes nay. So ordered. Next order of business. Uh, next item on the agenda is the authorization to draw on the general fund operating reserve to fund HOC's operations as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so, again, we are asking for approval to be able to draw on the general fund <coughs> operating reserve. Um, you know, we have started to experience um, some impact on our, our rent collections and um, we're working through the final numbers for June, but right now we're, we're at 78% out of the middle of the month. Um, we uh, want to be able to access the reserves in the event that our operating cash falls below, at or below $2 million. Um, we've done some cash flow projections, and we just want to have, the uh, again, the authorization to access those funds in the event that we well, the, the BFNA uh, committee is recommending approval of this. Uh, we're also recognizing that we're coming up on the end of the additional payment for unemployment as of July. And if one can read the tea leaves, the newspapers, or whatever, uh, the political process doesn't seem at this point poised to extend that. So we could be facing more serious problems down the road. Uh, but all of that noted, I would move approval of resolution 20-54. I second it. It's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 20-54. Any questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, Commissioner Coon? Aye. I'm sorry. Okay. Fine. Those opposing nay? Consider approved. Next order of business. Government Finance Committee? Commissioner Simon? I don't see her. See, have we lost her? We have uh, before us some new information and requests regarding um, submittal of a pilot for the Missing Middle Initiative, which I must say is a very exciting concept. And I think um, we're going to learn a lot and we're going to produce uh, some very constructive things in Sandy Spring. Who is uh, 
Stacy, are you presenting this or Kareen? Kareen uh, is, is there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is Kareen Brown, Chief Investment and Real Estate Officer. Um, I've got Jay Shepard uh, prepared to discuss this. Uh, this item, as Commissioner Simon indicated, was discussed in committee on the 19th of June. And I'll turn it over to Jay um, for um, main highlights. Zach Marks is also available. And with that, Jay, would you please uh, take over? Thanks. Sure. Uh, thanks, Irene. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, this is Jay Shepard. I'm the Senior Analyst in Real Estate Development. And um, as, uh, as was just mentioned, this is the, the Sandy Spring Missing Middle uh, project. We're here to ask for a second phase of pre-development financing to um, carry that project from co concept through site plan. And I'm um, going to go through the, the overview and it starts on the executive summary on page 43 of your brief books. Um, it is kind of the highlight and then we'll go through a little bit more in detail. But um, if you recall back in March, the commission approved a $75,000 to kick this off. Um, we started with the concept of uh, the, the site, which is at Sandy Spring Meadows uh, in, in uh, Sandy Spring. It's right off Route 108. And back in 2015, that property, starting in 2015, that property underwent a uh, rad conversion. It was renovated as part of the conversion. And also in 2015, we bought a, uh, a single family detached house at the corner of the entrance to Sandy Spring Meadow at 617 Olney Sandy Spring Road. And, and so this, this site uh, is essentially um, part of it, well, it's all of 617 only Sandy Spring Road, but then it's also a part of the Sandy Spring Meadow property. And because it's larger than three acres, uh, they were, we were able, and we were, and they both were zoned R60. We could take it through what we think would be this um, process uh, of site planning to add some density to this particular parcel. And so density that's uh, far and beyond what you'd find normally in R60 zone. And so the, the idea um, is going to go through, uh, you know, the, the entitlements process. And so it will be modified um, and, you know, further due diligence and, and that process will, will ultimately determine what's, what's there and what it looks like. But right now, and based on conversations we've had with planning, uh, we expect to add nearly 20 new homes. And this is, if you look on the, the map you have on page 45, it's right next to the Envision Village Center. Uh, that was part of the master planning process um, five years ago. And it would ultimately demonstrate the, um, the type of, and density that can be achieved uh, while keeping the historical nature of Route 108 uh, and also the residential characteristics of a suburban community uh, in Montgomery County. So um, the, the, the staff prepared a, a preliminary concept plan. It was taken to planning for some initial feedback. The, uh, the packet further outlines kind of a timeline um, on page 48 as to what that process is going to look like next. Uh, and so we are asking for now a second tranche of funding uh, from the OHRF to carry this forward through site plan. Um, we, we, fully, we fully expect this to be kind of driven by HSC and, and less so by the, by the county. Um, and, but you know, they, they will be riding next to us on this the whole way. Uh, and we are documenting these steps as we take them and feedback we get from them uh, so that we can better inform uh, how this, this development will shake out at the end of the day and how much it will cost and where decisions that are made throughout the process, but sometimes very early in the process can really have a big impact later in the process in terms of cost. Uh, so that if the county or other developers uh, in the in the Montgomery County want to do this type of project later, 
they'll have at least a baseline to see, you know, where these costs accrued from and, and came from. And so that's also a really key component of this particular project. Um, so it is really forming a, a demonstration for future projects that could be of this type and density. Uh, so ultimately the, um, uh, the decision at the committee for development finance was to advance this to the commission for recommendation of approval. And so staff is, um, is asking for that uh, next funding tranche of 330,000. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Um, Jay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner. Um, the committee had some uh, significant reaction to some of the planning staff um, concerns. And I wonder if you've That's had true. a chance to carry those back to the planning staff for reaction. Uh, part of it was keeping this community, uh, expanding it and making it a broader community with more space and some concerns about parking that had been recommended, um, I believe by the transportation staff. And I'm just wondering whether you've had any feedback yet or any response to those concerns that the committee had. Um, well, thank you for that question. And we, we did document those uh, concerns that we discussed at the committee. Um, and, and some of those had to be actually drawn out in, in further concept design, but we've not actually had a chance to go back to planning staff uh, yet to okay. gather their feedback, no. Okay. But that would be a first step. Um, we do, we do um, solicit, you know, or we, ask them you know for to let them know what we've we heard them uh, but that in certain circumstances if we don't agree uh that that here's why it would not make sense to go that route and usually that's a discussion that's better had you know over the phone or through sure. the, the communication yeah well um the committee does recommend this go to the full commission for approval and i make the motion to adopt the resolution. Uh, before we do or, that, Jay, this is Commissioner Byrd, just have a couple of questions, please. Yes, of course. Um, do we have residents living in that, in the Sandy Spring area now? We have, we, well, we have oh, yeah. the Sandy Spring Meadow community, which is uh, 55 units. Uh, and I believe those are fully occupied. And there, if you go to the map on, uh, sorry, on page 45, page 45, uh, if you see in the back there, there's um, 25 single family detached, which we own, and then 30 townhome, a cluster of 30 townhomes. And, um, and, and those are, yeah, those are occupied. Uh, okay. the, the house is unoccupied at 617 only, Sandy Spring Road. Okay, and so we'll end up with 20 new homes, you said, in, at the completion of this project, and we would 100% own those? Is that what I heard? We would own and rent them, yep, and, and we're looking for 20 additional. So on top of the 55, you'd have, uh, you'd have one lost because of the 617 house. That does mm -hmm. have to be demolished, uh, but then... Uh, uh, roughly 20 new additional, uh, so a, a, a net, we're, we're estimating a net of 20. So it'd be about 21, 2021. We're not sure entirely. Uh, that'll depend a little bit on um, that site plan process, but it it's gonna be all net new. And we okay. had, a, the committee had asked some questions about some home ownership, and there was an answer to that question. Uh, was there not? Uh, yes, um, this is Kareen speaking. Um, it can't be home ownership because um, most of the land on which the units are to be built uh, is currently subject to uh, a mortgage as part of the RAT6 property, as well as um, a HUD use agreement because Santa Spring is part of the RAT6 uh, Development Corporation. And so um, there will be uh, a lease um, a sublease uh, for this um, ownership entity. 
And so it cannot be a home ownership community, yeah. at least 20 units. Uh, Mr. Shepard, uh, if you could just take a minute to explain the concept of the missing middle for those who may be unaware of it, because this is coming in newly as a, a new approach. It's just starting to evolve in terms of practitioners in the housing area talking about the missing middle. So could you for a minute describe who benefits from this approach and, and, and why we are pursuing it? Sure, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's essentially, um, the way I understand it is that it's essentially a way to have increased housing density uh, while keeping the character of a typical residential suburban neighborhood, which has setbacks from the street, it has lot lines, you know, distances from the lot lines for the housing. Um, and, and so you start to get this structure um, when, when you have a normal uh, suburban development, you can only fit, you know, so many ho homes on an acre um, because of those setbacks and so on. And so what the missing middle accomplishes is it 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 um, it 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 keeps the scale, um, but it creates almost larger larger homes that are triplexes, um, in a very really uh, architecturally significant way, uh, so that it doesn't feel like it's dense, but it still has the unit count that's much higher, um, and so a, a good picture. Um, a good picture is on your in your packet on 40 page 46. Um, and I guess a good example might be in if anyone's familiar with uh, Garrett Park, uh, there's a there's a post office slash blacks restaurant slash um, old house essentially. That, um, that kind of has this character that you might see at the bottom of this page of 46. Um, it, it's a large three-story structure. Um, it, it's got porches, porticos. Uh, so it, it keeps that residential feel, but it allows for additional units uh, to, to be included. Um, and so part of the big struggle or part of the challenge might be with Stormwater and how you uh, how you address um, management of of the uh, impervious surfaces, uh, but but uh, this this particular site will be able to um, utilize the open space Mike. to to accomplish that. And, there are packages, accomplish that. and so that that's a really unique part of the uh, the density too. Is you've you've got some utility and some um, some site man water management issues that you got to be aware of and but they can be accomplished through bioretention uh, facilities that really create nice open spaces um, and 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 I'll really blend into the overall neighborhood. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's yeah, it does, it does. The project. yeah that was helpful. And so we will have no issues with the Sandy Spring Museum as far as encroaching on their space at all? N not on the museum, no. The museum okay. yep, is uh, actually just at the next next block. Okay, great. Thank you, Jay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is a nice, this, this slide and the one before it, are two slides that I would recommend that if the way we could post these on our website, just because this is a new area that we're going into, it's information that people can refer to, and you can separate those two out. This gives you a context for understanding what the whole missing middle demonstration is about, okay? I, I appreciate that, Commissioner, and I think um, uh, we're, we're certainly happy to do it. I, I do want to get through our conversation with planning um, uh, because depending on what their comments are, what changes they're suggesting, uh, and, and generally what their appetite is, this might change um, yeah, sure. a bit, so, but, but absolutely. Um, okay. I, think, I think the other issue, if I remember correctly, is Jay, is that there will be duplexes here, which are more familiar to people and more common in the county, though not terribly common, more common than triplexes. That's right. Yeah, that's true. 
And by doing this, we are opening up more common space in this broader community for um, recreation or park or whatever uh, to add community space in this area because now the only two places where people can congregate are at the firehouse and the museum. And so we're strengthening that component of community building, are we not? Yeah, that's a good point, which I didn't mention. Uh, it is in the back on page 45. Um, that th The reason that it's 3.3 acres is because it, it pulls in that open space that's shaded and blue in the, in the back. Uh, you know, all of those have lots that that currently extend and touch each other. And so what this would actually do is create and dedicate an open space in the middle there that can be used for recreation. Um, as the commissioner Simon noted, uh, and, and so uh, that is a key component actually of this whole plan. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, do we get a motion to approve resolution? Let, let me ask this, uh, Commissioner, just one one second. So this will give more walking space in Sandy Springs. Is that right, Jay, Commissioner Kroon? Um, it, it's where that's exactly part of um, part of this is to give them uh, access, better access out to Route 108. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and really tie it to the new which isn't there yet, but the village center. Uh, so it's positioning posi uh, positioning it uh, so that it will be a, a key component right across the street, and you'll have great access to all that. And so Thank you, Jerry. That's all I'm right. sorry, Commissioner Lori. No, no problem. This is, this is what it's for, to ask those questions. <laughs> are there, are there any other? Um, can we get a motion to approve Resolution 20-55? I moved motion 20-55. I'll second. Commissioner Bird, I second. Okay. It's been probably moved and seconded. Any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those is nay. So ordered. Aye. Resolution 20-56. <laughs> We're now moving to um, the approval of some short-term tax exempt notes to assist in the um, phase two at Shady Grove. Okay, um, good afternoon. Commissioners, again, for the record, I'm Kareen Brown, Chief Investment and Real Estate Officer. And um, a number of folks have worked on this um, from the real estate side and mortgage finance side. Jennifer Arrington, um, from the mortgage finance side um, is available, as well as Marcus and Marcus Irvin, Zachary Marks, and Gio Cavalazzi from the real estate side. Um, uh, again, this went to the Development and Finance Committee on June 19th. We're asking your approval of a bond authorizing resolution for the issuance of tax, short term tax exempt notes um, for up to $100 million and um, for, um, for, with PNC to preserve volume cap that was previously issued um, by CDA, Maryland CDA and Community Development Administration, as well as for the financing of 900 Thayer, and I'll get into the details uh, later on. But by adopting this resolution that's before you, um, you'll also be approving PNC Bank as the lender for this facility and um, you'll be approving a cost of issuance budget and um, of about $550,000, uh, which is, uh, I should point out, is about $50,000 more than we discussed in committee. And um, you'll also be um, approving the source of, of the funding of the cost of issuance budget as the um, County Revolving Opportunity Housing Development Fund, um, which currently has a balance of about $4.5 million available. Um, in, in your packet, the executive summary um, essentially gives some background information on the project or on the development. The, um, the land was purchased uh, in December of 2019, and since then, uh, staff has been working to 
finalize certain design elements and preparing to submit uh, for building permits. And uh, at the same time, we've been um, reviewing and evaluating financing options for this development. From the outset, we, um, we knew that for timing reasons, as well as our desire to achieve the lowest borrowing cost for the transaction, as well as to keep the, um, the private participants in the transaction as, the, as they desired, we, um, we knew that the, the tax credit option was not um, ideal for us, particularly because of limited uh, resources that are available to us. And uh, on slide 56, uh, we uh, briefly touched on, on NCAP and, and the issues that we face there. As you all are aware, HSC receives an allocation of 38 million annually by formula of private activity volume cap. And that is the amount available for both multifamily and single family executions. So as you're aware, um, that is not nearly enough to fund um, the HSE pipeline. Um, we've been looking at two potential options. Um, first, the use of governmental bonds. And um, we, as we um, explore financing options available to us and um, work to be creative, um, the opportunity to recycle multifamily volume cap was presented to us. And um, we've been working uh, on figuring that out since then. And that is the subject of uh, tonight's discussion. Uh, just very quickly, uh, with respect to the schedule for the transaction, uh, as I said, we're preparing to, the, the real estate side of the transaction is preparing to submit for building permits. And we're expecting that um, we should have those in hand um, in the November, December timeframe. We will obviously come to the commission for approval of the final development plan and other actions, as well as for the, um, the finance plan. This is uh, essentially an interim step to preserve the ability to um, use this private activity volume cap. Um, uh, on the next several pages, we um, have provided to you uh, an overview of the development. Uh, as you already know, this will be a 268 unit development at uh, a strategic uh, metro node in Shady Grove. 30% uh, of the units will be affordable to households with income at uh, 50% uh, and uh, of the area median income, 20% will be at 50% of the area median income and 10% at uh, MPEU levels, resulting in 30% uh, overall restriction in affordability. Um, it's, it will be a very well designed development and uh, very well built with accessibility to um, nearby employment as well as accessibility because of its metro location to employment outside of um, the general area. Um, so uh, I wanna jump now to slide 64 uh, to discuss the recycling uh, of the transaction, the recycling transaction. So um, there's currently about 100, um, point, 100 million, 500,000 of bonds outstanding, short-term financing outstanding. Um, most of it has been issued by CDA to private developers and, um, and a portion of it has been issued by HOC for the funding of the 900 Thayer transaction. And there's a provision in the um, IRS, IRS tax code that allows for multifamily, um, for the recycling of multifamily cap. Just as, a, as an aside, uh, in the single family program, this recycling happens routinely. When we come to you and ask for um, the ability to draw on the line to preserve um, the, the single family volume cap so that we can recycle it into another single family bond issue and you approve it, that happens routinely. For multifamily, it's a little um, trickier because the timing has to line up um, precisely and uh, there are limitations as to what type of transaction we can uh, use this recycling for. Uh, it still happens that um, because of the participants in the transaction, um, we've got private participants as well as HSC, so we're able to use it uh, for this Shady Grove transaction because it is not a tax credit transaction. That's one of the um, uh, requirements of this recycling. And so the developers um, who uh, CDA funded um, will uh, show up on the dates, on their redemption dates. So let us, uh, as an example, pick the August date at the um, top part of this chart, top um, uh, left of the chart, you'll see $51 million um, 
to be refunded or to be repaid on, on August 1st. So the developer will um, show up at CDA and, and provide $51 million to retire those short-term bonds. If CDA were to retire the bonds or pay off the bonds, the cap will be extinguished. Instead of doing that, they will um, give those funds to HOC in the middle and HOC will invest those, um, deposit those money in a guaranteed investment uh, contract. Uh, PNC will provide HOC a loan of $51 million. So rather than CDA paying off the bonds with the developer's $51 million, C, uh, PNC will give to CDA $51 million. So it's an exchange of funds. CDA gives HOC $51 million. HOC gives CDA $51 million of the loan from PNC. The exchange happens, the volume cap is recycled. Uh, and those $51 million sit in that guarantees, guaranteed investment contract until um, HOC is ready to um, issue the permanent financing at the closing of the construction loan at or around uh, January of uh, 2021, which is a projected date. And so this happens in August for that first $51 million. It happens again in September when HOC is prepared to repay the 900 th uh, transaction. And again in November, when HSC, uh, I'm sorry, CDA is ready to pay off that second, that third, uh, or its second tranche for $26 million. And we would only issue up to the amount that's needed. So if it turns out that the number is less than 100 million, it will be less than 100 million. And that um, achieves the exchange. The commission is, has no, no real exposure as far as this is issuance is concerned, because the 100 million is sitting in a guaranteed investment contract. It's 100% collateral to PNC. If the commission decides to abandon the structure, which you know I, I don't think it will, but um, you know the funds are there to repay PNC. Um, the next chart essentially just describes in words um, the, the the process as it works. Uh, I, I'll I'd like to point out, however, that um, there are a couple of or at least one major difference here uh, in terms of bond council, Kutak Rock and Ballot Spar our bond counsel to HOC, they're also bond counsel to CDA, um, which because they're on, on CDA side of the transaction, um, there's a, there was a um, conflict of interest. And so um, they requested that we waive that our conflict and allow Kutak Rock and Bell to represent CDA. We went through a proc procurement and selected a firm out of New York, Barclay Damon, who has um, experience in this type of transaction to represent HOC, uh, and they will be our bond counsel on this transaction. Um, uh, U.S. Bank is a trustee because ultimately this financing will be under the uh, 1996 indenture, the, um, as the mortgage will ultimately be backed by the FHA risk share program. K. Miller will serve as financial advisor. Um, and as I said, uh, Glenda will be PNC for this transaction. We received um, proposals from PNC and Bank of America for the transaction. And on the next page, um, Nick, if you flip to the next page, um, the out, outline of the two proposals are shown there. They're essentially the same transaction, uh, except for, um, for cost of issuance. Um, the proposal for 100 million financing, um, either under the 96 indenture or as a standalone facility, um, proposed um, interest cost at um, LIBOR plus 57 basis points. That's what it is. And um, for, wait, I'm sorry. LIBOR plus. Uh, So there's a LIBOR floor of uh, 50 basis points. Um, can you scroll up a little bit? Um, yeah, 57 basis points and 60 basis points. So Bank of America's proposal is uh, LIBOR, the 30-day LIBOR plus, um, plus 57 basis points and for um, PNC, 60 basis points. So it's a difference of three basis points. The main difference in the two transactions is really in the um, uh, cost of issuance, um, relate, cost related to the issuance, and um, given that PNC will be using its um, uh, loan documents that exist uh, for other facilities that we have, um, the the transactions transaction costs um, 
we believe are are not um, for PNC are not significant. I believe could be a little bit higher for Bank of America because um, it is it is we've not done a transaction like this before, and um, the cost could easily spiral. So for a three thousand or so difference, uh, we recommend selecting uh, PNC uh, for this transaction. Um, next slide, please. And so the um, the request uh, before you again is for the approval of a bond authorizing resolution for up to a hundred million dollars um, to effect the recycling transaction for the Shady Grove the West Side Shady Grove financing approval of the cost of issuance budget for up to uh, five hundred and fifty thousand dollars and to select PNC as the lender. Um, I really do want to emphasize that this is an interim step. Uh, the, the financing will be outstanding for no more than six months uh, by statute. And um, when the construction financing closes, and uh, we've not presented the construction financing to you yet because that's a, it's a separate process, it is anticipated that it will be a combination of um, bank financing and, um, and equity. And um, at the time that transaction closes, we expect to issue refunding bonds, which, which proceeds will repay PNC, and um, the funds that are in the gig will be transferred into the 96 indenture and escrowed until we're ready to convert to the permanent financing at the end of the construction and stabilization of the property. Kareem, there were two, two issues that perhaps you could explain for people who are, have not been following uh, our process of using FHA risk share and describing what that does and how it protects HOC. And then also, I'd like to talk a little bit about the 30% the thirty percent of low income and how the committee has asked that the staff look at some other ways to drive that to increase that percentage or to drive down the income range um, of sure. some of the that 30 percent sure um so so the fha risk share program um, essentially provides credit enhancement for the bonds that hsc issues um in the in the in the 96 indenture uh, which is the, the most HSC's most active um, multifamily indenture, uh, all of the bonds that are issued there must be rated AAA. Um, it's a requirement of a rating agency um, so, so that they have to have the same characteristics because they're all in parity. All of the revenues are pledged um, across all the um, bonds that are issued there. And so the FHA risk share program provides that. Without uh, AAA rated um, credit behind the bonds, they cannot be issued under that program. And so the mortgage insurance that the risk share program provides um, uh, gives it that, that characteristic. HOC uh, has the ability to assume as little as 10% of the risk in the program or as much as 90% of the risk in the program. And the 25 basis point fee that's charged for these uh, for the mortgage insurance premium is allocated according to the amount of the risk uh, that's borne by HSC and FHA. In the event of a default um, under any of the mortgages, um, which HSC has never defaulted, and there's been very little default under the risk share program because the developer or the issuer has skin in the game and uh, stands behind these, these mortgages. Um, in the event that were to happen, FHA steps in, pays off the bonds and the bondholder um, is made whole and goes away, and then it, HSC would enter into a debenture with FHA and has five years to work out the mortgage, and that workout can take a number of forms. It could be um, a disposition of the property, and if at the end of the disposition there's a loss, the loss is borne based on the amount of the risk that's taken, or there can be a workout where the property is put back into good standing and continues operations. So. Um, because of the strength of the federal government behind these mortgages, um, uh, they're rated AAA. And so when we go to the market to sell these bonds, we were able to command um, favorable interest rate and are able to finance our program. Yeah. Great. And then um, as you talked about the at the present time when this 
scenario was developed and you brought it to us, the expectation was 30% of the units would be affordable. Sure. And the committee has asked that you make the staff make every effort to find other ways to either increase the number of affordable units or to increase the amount of subsidy um, to a percentage of that 30%. So, um, and I'm gonna lean on Marcus and, and maybe Zach a little bit. Um, I think one of the main issues here has to do with certain um, taxes that were, um, we're not waived from currently. Yeah, so, I, I, actually, let me interrupt you on that, Karine. So, because this, this is, yeah, this, this is less of, uh, Commissioner, I appreciate you raising it. Um, there are a number of sensitivities around how we get there um, that we're pro we're not ready to make public at this time. But sure, that noted, that noted, yes, um, as is uh, consistent with the commissioner's uh, <laughs> efforts in the past. You're asking us to enhance. Uh, the number of perpetually affordable uh, units, and that's either um, you know, by uh, a, a, an additional subsidy or um, uh, fixing the affordability of the of the particular unit. Um, one or both of those have um, certain financing implications, which we still have to meet out. But uh, but we're committed nonetheless to to delivering um, a greater number. Uh, and I'd ask uh, the the Commission's indulgence just for a bit. Yes, you frame the issue beautifully. We 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 are signed on to uh, <clears throat> identifying more. We want to do it responsibly, but we also want to make it perpetual. So um, yes, uh, and, and in a way that does not impair uh, either the property or the commission, uh, so that so that both can meet their promise. So if you'd give us um, uh, uh, just a little bit of time, because this one. As you can imagine, um, the structure challenging. Yeah, this well, yes, but also, <laughs> Kareen has in and sort of uh, ten minutes of talking uh, summed up uh, around uh, um, three or four years of thinking about how to come at um, uh, a a resources issue uh, and deal with a, a vol volume cap challenge that that we've been uh, plagued with, as well as I mean, what it also points to. Um, I think is a for Montgomery County uh, at large is uh, the, the the lack of availability and, and focus of the nine percent low income housing tax credit as well as the timing of um, a, a deal like that which is designed to bring uh, uh, at least semi perpetual uh, how, uh, affordable housing to market. Um, but we've we've sort of forced uh, the, the the market mechanism to meet our timing in in a transaction which um frankly typically you're not able to do when other parties are involved and so well i raised the issue simply for the benefit of people who may be watching and have not been familiar with how we struggle to assure that the property is sustainable through its lifespan and that we are able to maintain and offer a competitive product in the marketplace, but also to constantly be aware of and trying to create new and unusual and additional ways that we can increase the affordability at the same time. Right. Yeah, I, I, and I, I absolutely appreciate the point. Certainly, I agree with you. I want to point out for those who might be listening that this is not a one off. I mean, we what we also try to do is uh, offer scalable um, uh, solutions that we can replicate and, and, and ease of replication is always an issue. But uh, this is not only a, a set of tactics and strategies uh, and tools that can be used uh, by HOC, but uh, quite frankly, um, virtually any local housing finance agency, it, I mean, it's not as if we took something from whole cloth and made it up. Uh, what staff did and, and, and has done ex exceptionally well, I think, is uh, to take uh, a set of strategies and pull them together, weave them um, uh, so that they're all focused on perpetually affordable housing that's amenity rich and incredibly well designed 
uh, and, and approximate to transit uh, in this, in this world-class county. Are there, are there other questions? Um, Kevin, this particular resolution has like four different actions associated with it. Right. So, so this is, this is the official bond authorizing resolution, um, prepared by bond council, um, which has, um, the typical verbiage and, um, and a couple of other things that authorize, for example, authorization for cost of issuance in the source and um, all the typical approvals um, that you would uh, normally see in, in a bond authorizing resolution is this is a legal document that permits the issuance of the bonds by the commission. Yes. And the committee recommends approval. The committee recommends. And I would so move. Okay. Move. Second. Resolution 56. And I go over the list and description of all of what we propose with <laughs> all four pieces to this. That we described very well. Uh, so, are there other questions? If not, all in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed is nay. So ordered. Thank you very much for really explaining a very complicated transaction <laughs> in a simplified manner. So I appreciate, appreciate that very much. Well, thank you for bearing with us on this. Yes. The next action is, is, is a presentation by the legislator, uh, Commissioner Keller. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, we met on Monday and what we are bringing forward today to the commission has to do with the various regulatory relief and well, regulatory relief proposals that HUD has made available and HOC staff has gone through them all. And there's a chart, an eight page chart in here of each of the items where we are able to either waive particular regulations or use alternative ways of uh, complying with the regulations. And the staff has indicated for each item, uh, the section, that it comes from a summary of basically what it does, the period that it extends to, and whether or not we are going to choose to implement that relief or continue with our current practice. And I just want to point out the fact that it takes eight pages of a chart for all of the changes related to COVID. These are all COVID related changes give some sense of the extent to which staff throughout HOC in every department are having to deal with COVID um, in different ways or work around through things. There were eight chapters of our, um, uh, our plan that we submit every year to HUD which were affected by these various waivers or permissions to do things separately. And after a wonderful presentation on these various issues and the amount of time that staff has spent working on them, we voted to recommend that the committee accept staff's recommendations here on whether or not to adopt each of these waiver authorities and to modify our plan as such. They have various dates for when they end. A lot of them end the end of July, actually, but some extend beyond that. And so um, there may be legislation extending these in the future, and we may come back and let you know that some of them have been extended either beyond the July 31st to the October 31st deadlines that they currently have. But for now, we recommend that the co full commission um, approve staff adopting these and modifying our annual plan accordingly. So I move that we um, approve, let's see, do we have a motion number here? 20-57. Yes, 20, uh, motion 20-57. 
um, mm -hmm. accepting all of staff's recommendations on these waiver authorities. I second that. It's been properly moved and seconded that we approve resolution 20-57 for the amendment to the administration plan in order to handle COVID related amendments being promulgated by HUD pursuant to PIH notice 20-05. All those in favor of approval, signify by saying aye. 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 Those approval, disapproval, say nay. So ordered. And let me thank the committee for your work in going yes. through a very lengthy document to uh, go through and synthesize eight pages of changes that were being recommended by HUD. And interesting because this is only PIH notice 20 05. So HUD have not promulgated a lot of notices this year. All right. So, um, uh, that we are doing is, I think, is very important and also will benefit our, our participants in the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So thank you all for your work. It actually benefits our staff as well because some of them help improve the safety of our staff in carrying out their duties um, by reducing the amount of time that they have to go into residence apartments. And uh, that also helps the residents as well. And I would also just point out that I know Stacy and perhaps some of the other staff were instrumental in helping HUD understand what waivers we actually could benefit by having. And so this agency helped to shape HUD's implementation of some of these waivers, which we're now able to accept and um, make our work a little bit more sane than it otherwise would be under the current conditions. Thank you. I appreciate that, commissioners. Uh, can I just uh, just to offer a quick word? So there, are, as Commissioner Kelleher noted, there are a number of these waivers that uh, do expire in July, and and this was uh, much of this was based on uh, a, a notion that uh, we would see significant um, decline in uh, COVID uh, nineteen rates of infection, and um, uh, as we all know. Uh, we're not in fact seeing that we're not experiencing it and so um you should certainly expect that uh staff um that i will along with our partners and the national uh, association for housing redevelopment uh officials um be pushing to extend some of these protections uh because uh, it looks like we're in for a long drawn out uh, uh fight with with covid 19 um and you know, there, there are some folks who are, um, who are battling the science and some of those folks have, happen to be in the administration. So we will continue to, to try and be vigilant to ensure that we're um, uh, allowing for as, as many uh, opportunities to protect staff and customers as, as possible. Uh, uh, so um, I'll keep you posted about that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank that, you. That concludes our committee work. And so we will now move into the portion of the agenda dealing with new business, which is resolution number uh, 20 58 uh, regarding the approval uh, to withdraw on the original PNC bank line of credit to bridge receipts of the county loan funds for the renovation of Brook Park apartments. Who's going to make that presentation? Um, for this one, we've got Gio Cavalazzi, uh, who will walk you through this. Um, Gio, briefly, please. Sure. Thank Good you. evening, Commissioners. Um, this is Gio Cavalazzi. I'm a, a Senior Financial Analyst Real Estate Division. Um, so uh, construction at Brook Park renovation work is already underway. We started in December of last year and we had, um, uh, as you may remember, we had a $5.2 million initial acquisition loan from DHCA and there was a balance left from the acquisition loan that we used to start the construction activities. Uh, we also have a commitment letter for a second loan from DHCA. We received that back in April of this year, and we were expecting to close that loan by this time, but uh, because it's a federally funded loan, it has some environmental review requirements that take um, time. And those are um, in progress currently, but the loan hasn't closed yet. We anticipate the loan to close uh, sometime in July or early August. And in the meanwhile, um, to enable us to continue construction activities and uh, to avoid interruptions and um, additional costs associated with interruptions, 
we are requesting your authorization to draw on the line of credit um, <clears throat> pay for the construction uh, until we receive the uh, the loan is, uh, closes and uh, soon after the loan closes we'll use the proceeds of that loan to repay the line of credit and the amount of that transaction so the um we are requesting 1.8 million dollars um up to 1.8 million dollars that's our projection of the need for for the construction to continue through the end of august um, we may not use all of that if we close the loan earlier than that um, and the the loan that's pending from the county is, a, is about 3.7 million dollars and that, that'll be sufficient to to finish the renovation i i move to approve resolution 20-58 Second. It has been properly moved and seconded to approve resolution 20 58. Are there any questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposes nay. So ordered. So we now approve that. We have now come to the end of our official business on our agenda. Are there any other items that uh, we have not been apprised about that's to come before us? If not, we declare this meeting uh, Wait a minute, uh, Roy. I think we need a motion to go into administrative session. Yes. Pursuant to section 3-305B of the general provisions article of the annotated code of Maryland, I move to adjourn this open session to a closed session to comply with specific constitutional, statutory, or judicially imposed requirements that prevent public disclosures about a particular proceeding or matter. A second. It's been probably moved and seconded to adjourn to administrative session. Any questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All this nay. So ordered. I move appro approval to adjourn. Second. Done. Uh, consider the meeting has been adjourned. Thank you, as of 5.17 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you.